Hello, animators and artists, and welcome to another Toon Boom interview. Tom LaBaff is a storyboard artist who started his career as an in-betweener and breakdown artist at Disney in the 1990s. Tom has since worked as a storyboard artist on projects as varied as Nomeo and Juliet, Rio, and Our Cartoon President. He has illustrated over 50 books and has been published by Scholastic, Pearson, Wiley, and IDW. Tom LaBaff is joining us today to discuss his career and the craft of storyboarding. Tom, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, man. Thanks for having me on. I totally admire Toon Boom and your show, so glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so, so one thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, storyboard artists carry a lot of weight on a production. In your view, how would you define a storyboard artist's job? Yeah, the quick answer to like what a storyboard artist's job is, I like to say they're they're kind of an interpreter and they need to interpret the written word to visuals. I mean, it's as, it's really as basic as that. I wouldn't want to get too much more detailed than that quick answer, but um, I like I also like to say when you're sitting around a table and someone has a very, you know, you know, someone wrote down a sentence, you know, um, a young man, you know, jumps over a rock and stubs his toe. You know, it's like, okay, we can all get that. We have character designs. We know what the man looks like. We know what the... But still, if those 10 people right now who are just reading that, they have 10 totally different things going on. How fast is he running? Is he drunk? Is he, you know, what happened right before that scene? Is he really pissed off and, and he's looking at his phone? You know, there's so much and there's like good ideas right there. I'd like, I would be like, I'd want to know why he, why did he stub his toe? And it could just, you could see how something like this in a story meeting could go on for a while, but it's really just interpreting the written word into visuals for sure. Yeah. Um, if you could give advice to writers right now, maybe some feedback that would make your life as a storyboard artist easier, what would it be? I'd say put down, put away the keyboard, put away the typewriter, whatever they use, and just let storyboards artists do what they do, man. We don't need, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. Um, I, I love good writing, you, you know, Michael, I, I just, when I see a good script, there's, it's just so, it's great. It's great because you're like, all the work is done. I mean, I've seen some really bad scripts and they're, they're all apologetic before they give them to you. Like, hey man, this is just a first draft and it needs a lot of work, which is fine too. There's, there's some enjoyment about getting in and retooling the story. But if I see a great script, and it's like the dialogue is landing, the jokes are landing. I'm like, wow, I can really focus on the performance part and rather than trying to make it, put the wheels on and get it working, you know? So, yeah, what I would say to writers, it really, that's so, so broad. It, just, it really depends on who it is. But I, I tend to like scenes, you know, see, scenes that are not overwritten you know, when they can kind of trust like the actor or the storyboard artist that they'll get it, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tee it up for, for us. They'll tee it up nicely. And then we come in and, and kick it. And it's a, that's what I like is that back and forth when they're not trying to describe every, every single thing, but they're just getting us in the right area. And then we take it from there. I, I think that's the way, that's the way I like to work anyway. Yeah. So you started your career working at uh, Disney Animation. Um, what was your experience like working in feature animation in the early 1990s? Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, you're, you're aging me, man. That's so long ago. No, but it, it's true. I was in on the golden age. I mean, it was after like Disney wasn't doing so great with their features, releases, um, what was the one? Uh, Rescuers Down Under didn't do that great. But for whatever reason, it just started really picking up. And I and I got a job at Disney at the same time, right out of school. So I landed it in, in the studio when things were really picking up. And I just I just thought, this is what the animation business is. You know, you get a job for 12 years and 
benefits and contracts and parties and rap parties. I was completely spoiled. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. And it felt, it felt like we went from ringling as kids and, you know, in school to like a professional environment like Disney and we were still kids and we we're still just, we we're all working on very, very hard on our projects. But when you're at, when we were at Disney, we were working on the same project, you know, it's like, oh, we're all working on Beauty and the Beast and we get to share dailies and you get to share milestones. And when, um, uh, you know, like Roy Disney would come to the studio and give a pep talk to everybody. And we're like, wow, you know, this is so cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just in a word, I feel kind of spoiled being at Disney right out of school for 12 years. Because then after that, I'm like, oh, this is what the industry is like. You jump from job to production. You got to negotiate over here and that. Uh, but, yeah, it was a gold, golden age for sure. Yeah. So when we were speaking earlier, you mentioned that you were working uh, out of Orlando initially um, at uh, Disney's Orlando studio, and you called yeah. it the fishbowl. <laughs> did not. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I did. It was a fishbowl. It was so funny because, you know, it was mostly for the tourists. Like they said, OK, let's open up a little wing and we'll let the tourists come through. And then we want them to watch artists who are actually working on a real movie. We don't want to fake it. So what they did was, you know, there's 30, maybe 40 artists that work in this fishbowl where people, tourists all day long would just be walking by, you know, tapping on the window. Um, you know, spring break girls would come through. I'm not saying anything crazy happened, Mike, but, you know, spring break women, you know, you, you know put up. So it was... It was cool, but what they did was they started giving us like bigger and bigger sequences. So we'd have a, a song from Lion King and we'd do really well with that song, you know? And they're like, hey, that, that Orlando studio is doing, doing pretty good. Let's give them a little more and then a little more. And before you know it, we kept hiring and getting bigger and bigger. And so that Orlando studio went from like 30 or 40 people in this fishbowl to building their own building. And I think we we're close to 400 artists and we did our own movies. Like Mulan was done entirely um, in Florida. I think Lilo and Stitch was almost all all entirely done in Florida. So yeah, it was great. I was in at the very beginning and then, and then all the way to the, the big end. Yeah. One of the things I really like uh, when I'm talking with animators is hearing about different production teams that were on projects because you don't, often hear about the production teams that created a, a final uh, animated piece. Uh, if, if you're just watching it, uh, for a lot of the audience, it might as well have just you know come from space fully formed. And I, I think it's really important to talk about the labor and craft that goes into it. Yes, for sure. It is. I, I couldn't believe it takes that many people to make a, a film when I was there. You know, it's like, hundreds and hundreds I'm like you're kidding me but you know the more I the more I saw what actually went into doing you know like a Beauty and the Beast or Lion King like every drawing it's like every piece every frame there's so many drawings that go into it it was crazy and then I'm like oh okay now I, I kind of know why it takes so many people to do this you know so compartmentalized that was new for me too I'm like you know I would when I when I when I first was working there, I just didn't realize there was that that many departments. You know, they had they had someone especially who just did like shadows. That's all they did was shadows on a character, and then someone who just inked the outer outer you know silhouette, um, background painters, in betweeners. Then you had like brackets below in between. You had a breakdown person. You had you know this kind of person. So it takes just so many people, but I agree, man. It's, um, it's a huge, huge, huge effort. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to ask you was, when did you decide to move from the animation uh, department to the story department, and, and what prompted that decision? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really big on, on, on um, storyboarding. Like, we would see dailies. Dailies happen once a week. Not sure why they call them dailies, but once a week we'd, we'd get in a room and watch the latest footage and scenes. 
and we'd see some stuff cut together and we'd see some reels and the story drawings were, I'm like, oh, those are kind of crude. Those are gross. You know, it didn't really inspire me. Uh, and then someone told me once, because I do a lot of like, I was doing a lot of illustration on the side, like moonlighting. And they're like, hey, your work looks like Mark Davis. I'm like, who's Mark Davis? So I go to our library at Disney and I look him up. And I loved his pen and ink work. Just, I'm like, wow, that's exactly like I love doing that kind of watercolor. And I just like, who's Mark Davis? And he's like, he hung out with Bill Keat. And I'm like, wait, who's this? There's this whole, un, there's this whole community like within Disney that had these giants, like story storyboard giants, like Bill Pete. I'm like, whoa. And then Bill Pete has this book. I'm sure you've seen it, the yellow book. Um, and I looked at his work and I'm like, oh, okay. So this is this is storyboarding. Storyboarding doesn't have to be those gross, crude drawings I see in dailies. It can, they can actually be like, you know, kind of like, uh, it, it's like they, every story artist can have their own style within a production. I'm like, oh, that's me. I, I, I've got a style. I want to get in there. I want to do that. So, oh, and the other, the other reason I got into story, Mike, is, uh, my, uh, I remember my buddy when I got, when I did first get to Disney, he, he tells me to come to his desk. He's like, come here, man, come here, check this out. And he's got a stack of paper on his desk and he's like, and he picks it up and flips it. He's like, and it was a close up of uh, Beast from, from Beauty and the Beast. And he was doing some dialogue and, and it had the shadows in there and the hair and the ears. And he was voicing it as he's flipping. He's like, you know, whatever the, I don't forgot what the voice was like, I don't want to take a bath. And, and he was actually miming the word. I'm like, okay, I can't do that. I am never going to be able to do that. But and it was, it was Aaron Blaze. And he's like a guy that I went to school with and he had his surf shorts on and flip flops. And he's just flipping through Beauty and the Beast. He's 22 years old. I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. I'm going to go and look somewhere else. <laughs> So story, I found my my people in the story department. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny because like different people really um, have a, a either a knack or a passion for different elements of the work. And um, something I hear a lot from from artists is that when when you leave animation school, you're kind of expected all to to go into animation, and that's not necessarily the only job in the industry. Oh, right. Yeah. There's, 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 you know, if you go to animation school, like Disney, uh, at, at, at Ringling at the time, we weren't at animation school. We were just fundamentals, you know, fine art, illustration, interior design, whatever. But yeah, you're right. Um, there's a lot, I mean, ad agencies, there's a lot of other, uh, a lot of, a lot of other creative, you know, content makers out there, especially today. I mean, there's all kinds of, of stuff to get into. TV is huge. Um, film, live action film. I, I'm not big on the whole live action side. I'd love to, but I just have been more focused on animation and stuff. But uh, if you go to school for animation and you come out and you don't get into animation, I guess, I mean, it just depends on what startup you're with. Like how cool would it be to be in a startup that, like you know, like Google. I mean, look at those. What look at what Google's doing with artists. Do you see those? Oh, Googles? the doodles. Yeah, the doodles. Like those are so cool. And there, a lot of that kind of stuff is needed in all these startups. So, Tom, in your view, how has the animation industry uh, evolved since the '90s? Yeah, I I think that's a good question. It's a it's a long answer, but just to just to, if I had to like. If I had to answer it in 60 seconds, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, technology go. point, yeah, go and go. No, I, I would say like, just look look at storyboarding alone. You know, just technology, the way technology has helped just storyboard artists. I mean, not to sound like the old man that I am, but we used to have to pin up the, you know, the drawings on, um, you know, every single panel. When you're done a pitch, you'd, pin it up on a big board and you'd have to put pins, four pins per panel. And if you had 200 drawings in a sequence, that's six, wait, four times, you know, do the math. That's a lot of yeah. pins, right? 
So you would you would be like, okay, I got a pitch on Friday, but um, um, Thursday is going to be for prepping the pitch, <laughs> just putting up everything, and then you pitch it on, and then you got to take it all down. So, so technology alone, yeah, like a, a software like you know Storyboard Pro, it's just there is no pinning. There's no more thumbtacks involved. So, you know, there's just and that's just storyboard. Imagine how that scales across the whole, you know, like the whole animation industry with harmony and and ink and paint and backgrounds and fixes. I mean, fixes are so, like revisions are such a big part of doing animation. So all the technology that I use makes revisions so much easier. You know, it's like you can just duplicate your timeline and be like, hey, I've got an alternate ending. Check this out. And you just pitch the ending, you know? Um, but yeah, how has it evolved? That's just one way. I mean, there's a million different ways. But for me, the way it affects me is, yeah, Cintiq drawing on digitally is, is just such a huge, huge help. Yeah. Uh, speaking of revisions, uh, and if any artists watching this are on LinkedIn, uh, they should absolutely follow you because you've been posting these this amazing series of 60-second storyboard tips. What was the idea behind the series? Thank you for saying that, by the way. You can go on, really. Go on a little bit more about how cool they are. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They are really cool. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it was like I, I was um, wanting to be challenge myself, you know, just to see how much I could teach in one minute, and it turned out to be... I can only teach one thing in one minute <laughs> and make it have any value at all. So, but honestly, like if you're working or, you know, you're prepping for lunch and you just want to get a little inspiration, I wanted to do that. I wanted to give someone just like, you don't need to, I'm not going to cover the basics. I'm not going to break out my ruler and tell you about vanishing points and three point perspective. I'm just going to give you the top, top fun little hacks that I do that make, make it fun, honestly. So that's kind of what I wanted to do, is just kind of just show what what is so fun about boarding. For me, it's this stuff. It's like, you know, here's the rough pass, here's how you make it better, and here's a little sound effects thrown in. Doesn't that look fun? And then maybe you learn something along the way. So that's that's kind of what I was uh, thinking. And I want to get back to it. I, I haven't done the last couple weeks, because it's, staffing season and there's it's been crazy with just negotiations and deals flying around so i didn't i didn't have time to focus on it but i do want to get back hey it's it's good to be busy right yeah yeah so uh, you're mentioning um like revision work on storyboards and the 60 second storyboard tips and it, it strikes me that a big part of the storyboard process is revisions yeah um, so, like, what are some things that um, you, you sort of look at when you see a first draft of a storyboard that you look for, uh, for how can I make this better? How can I um, improve the visual storytelling? Yeah, usually, I mean, like, first thing is clarity. Like, what I hate is, like, seeing this beautiful board that has backgrounds and shadows and shading and grays and highlights. But then it's like the silhouette's not reading, you know? I'm like, oh, they spent so much time, you know, polishing this turd when they when they could have just focused on the performance. Like, that, I think that's the way that I like to approach a scene is like, is this working? Could I pull my daughter in the room and say, and flip through it and say, what is he doing? And I don't say anything. I'm like, can you tell what he's doing? It's got to be that clear. And if that, if you get over that hurdle, like it's clear and it really works, then I would say start layering in the beauty part of it. Um, did that answer your question? What was your... I oh, think it did. Re revisions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what I do, Michael, is first look at clarity first, and then, yeah, just revise it. If, it does, if it's not there, if the clarity is not there, go in and do those revisions. Until that clarity is there, then you can, like, award, you know, reward yourself with, doing some tones, if that's what you do. Do you often run into situations where like a handful of small changes will improve a storyboard, like you nudge a character a little bit? Um, or, or do you more often have to discard entire drawings that aren't a good fit for a scene? 
<laughs> I'd say both for sure. Yeah, but sometimes that is the key. Like what you said, discarding, like you're trying to make something work, you're trying to land a gag and it's not working and you're trying to add drawings, like, man, I, I just must, I must need more drawings. I must need more drawings. So you get in and you're like, that's not it. But then you end up pairing them away. And then it's like, that was it. It was like, I'm trying to, it's the poetry of it. You're trying to take, just, just show what's essential and what's needed. And, and sometimes um, omission is the way to go, for sure. So, so it's not always additive. Sometimes it's a subtractive process where you're, you know, sculpting away the cruft to get something that uh, is uh, either beautiful or functional. Yeah, yeah, right, right. There, there was like a scene, though, to give you an example, like in Ivandoe, um, their director wanted something, the character, he wanted the character to do some sneaking action, just sneaking up and being silly. And I tried to do it as simple as I could. And it was there. It was like, it was kind of there, but it wasn't giving us how sneaky he was trying to be. He was trying to be like pet detective, Ace Ventura, sneaky, like just silly, silly stuff. And that, that instance required, yeah, you got to go, the, go the distance, put in all these little stupid drawings of him tiptoeing and then ducking. Um, so it just, it go. it really is case by case. It depends on what gag you're trying to pull off. Sometimes it will take a lot of drawings. Have you ever uh, drawn a storyboard panel that you really loved but knew that you had to get rid of? Um, all the panels I draw, I love. Michael, I, I gotta tell you that. I gotta be honest with you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, all the time, man. I mean, you've all you've heard the thing. You know, you gotta you gotta know how to kill your babies, kill your darlings. Uh, so don't get too attached. And that's something I did the first five years I was in, in storyboarding was you really, I'm like, I love that drawing and I'm going to make it stay because I love it so much. But yeah, you got to get over that. And you got to, you got to think more about like, I hate to say it, but the business uh, is like, is this telling, is this, is this helping move the story forward? Or is this just a pretty drawing that's there for color and for, you know, um, but yeah, you got to be ruthless for sure. That's why I want, you know, I think you had a question or maybe I was talking to someone else or maybe it's just talking to myself, but you like the editor, that's why editors are so good. Like, yes, a, a storyboard artist can make their own animatics because it's getting so easy to make animatics with your software. No, okay. And, but it's like, and that's what an editor is good for. You like, you do all your, your past the best that you can and you think it looks great and you pitched it to the room and it looks great. But then you got to move it on, like move it to someone else's eyeballs, let them get a fresh look at it. And they'll believe me, editors are ruthless. They're like, nope, not that one. Don't need it. Shorten that. And before you know it, it's, it's coming back to you. It's like half the size. But in the context of the whole episode or feature, it works because the editor has a good idea of the context. Like story artists get a little bit to, you know, that narrow vision, I think sometimes. So... That's a long answer. Sorry. Yeah, uh, you've worked on a, a really wide variety of projects. Uh, you mentioned Ivandoe. Uh, you worked on Nomeo and Juliet. You meant you worked on our cartoon president. Um, which of these uh, types of productions did you enjoy working on the most? Oh man, you're gonna make me answer that. No, no, they're all different for sure. Like, if, I would have to categorize them and say, well, there's TV series, and then I'd say the best out of that, and then features. And then the best out of that. And then, but um, I mean, they're all very different. Cartoon, Arch Cartoon President was fun, but all the gags are taken care of. Like, I love adding gags. I love adding my little bit. But those, like I was telling you, the, the writers, the SNL writers, they've got it covered. So you just basically are puppeting what they do. But it was still fun to, like, we're making fun of the president. I live in America, you know? So like that part of it was fun, but, oh, I wanted to say like, I'd say a feature, a recent feature that made me, give me, gave me the feels for like when I first got into feature was uh, Ron's Gone Wrong for Locksmith mm. and animation. I don't know that uh, JP Vine and Octavio were, were directing that and they, they have something special with that movie, man. It, it, it was when I saw it, when I worked on it. 
Um, I don't know. It was like it's like when there's a good concept for a film. It's like when there's a really good underlying log line or idea for a film, and you see it, you see that theme popping up in every sequence, and you get to be part of that, and you're like, oh, I get it's my turn to do the bronze gun ride. This is, and then you do it, and you're like, you know, those kind of like Mulan was like that. It was so thematic, you know. And that theme would be, we could tell it a slightly different in every sequence, you know. Um, so I like it when some writer or director has that kind of vision where they're like, they're really, they're really pulling the strings. They know how to tell this story. Um, and then like an art, you know, like a Ivan Doe or something like a TV series that's just silly and funny and just full of entertainment and gags. And there's no big theme or big driving force. Those are fun too, you know? It's like, I think the key, you know, back to your question, you see a lot of variety in my work. Yeah, I love jumping around and playing um, these different these different instruments. Uh, another thing too that I noticed is, uh, we mentioned at the top of the, the show that you illustrated over 50 books. And I really wanted to ask you, uh, how has your work as a storyboard artist influenced, influenced your work in illustration? Um, or vice versa, like, th does it change the way you think about composition, visual storytelling? Yeah, um, composition is all, it's on its own, you, you know, it, I wouldn't say, I, I guess they all do kind of help each other. The more you get, you know, good at composing a, a still image for an illustration, I guess that applies if you're picking a composition for a, you know, cinemascope, you know, um, project. But I think the biggest thing where storyboarding helped my illustration and vice versa is just not to be so tight. It's so easy to like get a piece of, get a, you know, pen in your hand and it's so easy to start noodling, man. It's, it's just, uh, you want to get in on that eyeball and give it a, give it a highlight, but and then you're kind of neglecting the, the rest of it. So I think storyboarding helped me really loosen up and, and get more gestural and spontaneous in my illustration, and which is why I probably was able to do quite a bit of books. Uh, you know, I, I just crank them out, and that's the way you keep it nice and fresh. I mean, look at Mark Davis's work. That's, I mean, it's just like he'd take watercolor and just, and just splash it on the paper. No plan, no nothing, just splash. And that's what art is. The art is just like express, expression and, um, so they definitely feed off each other. That's why I love storyboarding. It's kind of, my major was illustration, story, illustration, and they, kinda, they go hand in hand. Do you find that um, drawing pre-production material for the screen is, is very different than drawing uh, for print? And do, do you have to switch between the two, like your, your mindset when working on different projects or does it come really naturally to you? No, you, you have to get into character. You know, it's like, I imagine being like an actor and you have to assume a certain role. So if you're doing, you know, work for it, for print, it, it does have to have a certain finished quality to it. Um, and then uh, for animation, it's, it's much different. I mean, it, it depends, I guess, what you're doing. If you're, you know, if you're just roughing out storyboards, it's different than doing doing character design and final character design, that kind of thing. Um, but they're different. You got to get into a different mindset for a print, for sure. Excuse me. Uh, one question I wanted to ask you um, is, do you have any advice for students or artists outside of the industry who are interested in storyboarding? Um, general advice, interested in storyboarding, I would say try it. I mean, experiment all the time. Just, just get in and, and try it. And, and you may, may be surprised how well you pick it up. Um, cause it's a different animal. It's like, it's all, it's, it's just even animation, animation, you got to think character goes from here to here. And then your whole week is about moving this far on the screen. Usually, you know? Uh, storyboarding is like your week takes you from day one to like middle of whatever. It's like there's, you cover so much more ground. So 
yeah, if you're thinking about storyboarding, interesting to you, I would say listen to the fire in your gut and try it for sure. You know, jump in and try it. But then there's more stages. Like, what do you tell someone who's already in it, who's getting, who's not feeling it? What do you do then? I've, I've got, I've got plenty of ideas. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it'd be great to take questions. Do you guys take questions on this, or do you know? Do you not do questions? We, we, we there are opportunities for people to oh, okay. uh, chime in with questions in the chat. Uh, okay. So we're just, uh, if we get any really good ones, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. um, one debate that I see a lot in, in storyboards is uh, about the amount of shorthand that you want to include in a board. Uh, how loose versus how detailed should a, a, a typical storyboard be in your, your opinion or experience? Um, I, I would say rough pass. Most directors are okay when you say rough pass, you know. I'm trying to find an, a rough drawing. It's probably not rough enough. Can you can you see this? Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> right. Whoa, whoa. I mean, I as long as it communicates, like our story about the guy tripping over the rock. If I, you know, you know the story. You already know. You know what happens. So I don't really need to really bring it home for you first time. So I would just do stick figure, stick figure, rock, fall, laugh. I'd add sound effects. I would take over some of it. And as long as you're like, if I'm making you smile when it's stick figures, then um, that's good. That's a good sign. So there's that pass, though. But then, you know, every time the director sees it, they're going to want to see it a little bit tight, tighter, maybe you're more expressive. Uh, and then it just really depends on how much time you have for the production. You know, luckily, sometimes, like on Ivan Doe, you get the rough pass out and you give it to the revisionists, which is really great. But it just, it might, you got to just find out what your director wants and have that conversation up front and just say, do you mind if I just barf out all my ideas super fast, get them in front of you, get your feedback, and then on, you know, pass two, pass three, pass four, I'll be really tying them down. And then if they have the budget, we'll do past six, past seven, past eight, and get those tones going, get those highlights in the eyeballs. It depends on the budget. Hmm. How different do you find uh, your role uh, between productions? Like, do, do, you, do you feel that you're consistently doing very much the, the same sort of work? Or do you sometimes feel like you're doing very different jobs, even though your title's uh, similar? Um, if it's like in between productions, I'll, I'll definitely wear different hats. I like, like I said, I like trying different stuff. I don't want to get, you know, stale doing just storyboarding, just storyboarding all the time. I'm not crazy about advertising storyboarding when those uh, come up, but how different do I go? Yeah, I, I do like to change it up. That's me though. I mean, I like to, if there's an opportunity to direct a live action commercial, I'll jump all over because you're outside, you're at the golf course, and you're helping, and there's sun, and there's weather. It's like it's so much different than being in here. Um, but then I wouldn't want to be out there all the time. You know, I don't want to do that grind all the time. You're always in the sun, always dealing with actors. <laughs> um, but that's just personal taste. I, I like to change it up and, you know, as much as I can. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what kinds of projects do you uh, look for? Like, what sort of uh, projects are you excited to work on as a storyboard artist? Um, um, I, I would, you know, I would take that overall concept, like you know, the log line. Like, is it there? Like, Ron's gone wrong. Is is it is it that kind of concept where you look at it and be like, oh man, this can go on for days. I can run with this for days. Uh, what was the other one? Wish Dragon. Uh, I don't know if you heard of Wish Dragon by Chris Applehans. He's that was a really, really good script. Thought well thought out characters, environments were there, world building was there. All you can tell all that stuff when you read a script and you look at the some development work. I, I mean, I think I can anyway. Um, and then people, I mean, it, it, you, you know, you get the Zoom calls and you got to make sure that you're feeling it with the team. That's got to kind of be there. It's easy to put on an act when you're on a Zoom call, 
So usually that first call is kind of easy to make it appear like you everyone's working great, but it's it's after the couple you know, first couple of weeks of work with people, then you really know like, is this going to be a good relationship? <laughs> uh, can we continue this? But yeah, I think the right team, Mike, is is what I like to look for. You know, for sure, it's got to be it's people first, then the great project. Then money. Money's got to be in there somewhere. This has been like a really weird year for a lot of people working in animation. Um, are, are, are you used to working remotely and over Zoom? Or is this something that uh, sort of was, was new for you? No, I was pretty used to it. I mean, um, I've been doing it this way for a while. I, I've noticed that Anybody who is on the fence about maybe maybe working remotely, they're all the way over that fence now. <laughs> it's, they have to be. And uh, no, it's been really, it's kind of just business as usual, you know, for someone like me who's holed up in this office and I have to work remotely. Um, it's kind of normal. But I, I, I do agree it's been a weird year. This year's been weird. Last year was the crazy year, but somewhat, I read a meme somewhere. It said, hey, 2021, you can take off that disguise. We know you're just 2020. Because <laughs> uh, it, it, there's some crazy stuff happening for sure. But yeah, the remote model has been embraced. I do love that. But there's also, a, I've noticed like a double-edged sword to that, where studios now like, they're, they can get whoever they want. They're like, oh, we can just, it's, we can tap into this guy's studio, we'll get him to work, and, and then we'll let him go. And then we'll, get, and we'll try this person. So they're, they're getting a lot more variety. And it's easy, I think it's easier to pick the talent and get them on your show when you, when you let that, your guard down and you start welcoming people in remotely. So it's got a double edge, it's a double edged sword. But for the most yeah. part, I'm happy. I, I'm, for the most part, optimistic. I love that everyone's kind of embracing the model. I, I think a big part of it, too, is that um, for a lot of artists who find themselves working from home right now, uh, a lot of them didn't choose it. You know, it, it's different yeah. when you say, hey, you know, I'd really love to work remotely. And then find out, okay, well, uh, I'm sheltering in a place, so I guess I guess I'm going to be working remotely by default. I know it's not for everybody. I mean, I know I, it took some getting used to for me. I I've got to be super disciplined, Mike. I'm going to show you. Like this is just a typical. You can't really see it, but I've got to play like the manager part, man, production manager hat. I got to kind of wear that, make sure I'm not wasting too much time on Skype. Or, you know what I mean? You just got to really crack down and be disciplined. Not, not all artists can do that. You know, that's what was great about the studio model, being in the studio, is you have those people floating all around you all day long. Okay, quotas, quotas, you know. But, yeah, I don't have that here. So I do have to, I, ran, I had to ramp that up quite a bit. Um, but I got used to it. I'm fine. It's not for everybody. And there's some people I know that just can't wait to get back to the office. I had a Skype yesterday with guys who couldn't handle it anymore. So they're in the office next to each other on Skype. Both had masks on. <laughs> I'm like, why are you guys in the office? Why, why aren't you home right now? But to each his own. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, too, was uh, since you have uh, experience working remotely, do you have advice for the rest of us uh, about how we can stay sane, productive, uh, sane uh, during the, the next uh, period of lockdown until oh, uh, we're at the end? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I think you got you to gotta really learn to just, um, it's going to sound corny. You ready for it? You, All right. Yeah, let's, let's play it on me. You got you to you gotta learn to love yourself. Choose yourself first, you know. Um, I do have a lot of little hacks, though. I I live. I have my office is on the water, so I, I do have a kayak out there. So if I get too stir crazy, I'm out the door and into the water. Um, but I do. I break up my day with yoga. 
and I definitely meditate. I've embraced meditation full, 100%. I think that helps reset. It's like, it's kind of like in the morning when you have a cup of coffee and you're ready to tackle the day. You know, I love that feeling. I love that feeling all morning. But then when I didn't meditate during the afternoon, I would start to taper off and get kind of lethargic. But that's when, that's when like, if I meditate during the middle of the day, you all of a sudden for me, I had a whole new regenerate, you know, it's like regenerate. I regenerate and I'm back to that, uh, you know, full of energy in the afternoon. So, and then exercise, I'm in the gym all the time. I mean, yeah, come on, I can't you like tell? Too- Look at this. Hello. <laughs> I feel like the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to be looking at a screen uh, for eight hours and then yeah. finish your shift and sit down in the same chair and look at a screen for another, you know, four hours know. on top of that. I know. Um, we got a question in the chat from okay. uh, username Jules22 uh, saying, I'm just starting out with storyboarding my own film. What advice would you give me, and how do I stop getting too detailed in my work? Wow, Jules, good question. Good question. And I kind of, I was talking about that earlier, about being too detailed. I mean, that's like an artist, we we naturally want to just, you start doing a nice rough drawing, and you're like, whoa, stand back, and you want to continue it. But I'm telling you, Jules, if you can hold off on that urge uh, until you kind of rough out your whole scene, Make sure it's working. Make sure that clarity is happening. Make sure you show the director. He loves it. She loves it. Then let yourself go when you have that time. Like you have three days to tie it down. Have at it. Go ham. So just, I would say, try to throttle those uh, urges, Jules. I hope that helped, buddy. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you about was, uh, so, so with your 60-second storyboard tips, um, I wanted to ask if there were any features in Storyboard Pro that you feel that uh, artists should be aware of when they're working on storyboards. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, feature-wise, man, the storyboard, like when Storyboard Pro came on the scene, and I don't mean to sound like an advertisement, but it is true, and I tell anybody who will listen, is like the timeline is where it's at. It's like you guys made this uh, software for for storyboard artists. I mean, I'm convinced that some some story artists actually had a lot to say about the programming of it and the design. But I mean, the, what's magical to me, and I still can't describe it, and I still can't really understand it, but that timeline is where the magic happens. Because I don't know film that well. I told you, I'm not a huge film guy. I just love drawing. I love humor. I love being silly. But that timeline is kind of like a mentor. And it, as I scroll through all day long, flipping, it's telling me like that cut doesn't work. You know that that's that doesn't work. That you, that's not clear enough. And I'm flipping and I'm flipping. I'm like, damn it, you're right. And I and I just you know. So I really rely on that um, timeline as a really like a gut check all the time. Because um, you know we're in animation. It's motion. So you've got to always be testing it. Uh, is it working? Is it working? You know. So, you so kind of have a bird's eye view of the, the 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 production and being able to see like okay in the context of the story does this panel work? Yeah, right, right. It's like don't get too caught up on the nice little drawing. Make sure it's working as a whole, um, and that's that's what a timeline does. And then it's got a million other features. I mean, here's the other thing. Remember I told you noodling is so easy to start getting it. Like Photoshop's got beautiful brushes. They've got detail. They've got uh, fur rushes, they've got blend. We, we, we almost lost oh. you for a second. Man, uh, so with, with, sorry. With that in yeah. mind, um, where can our viewers find more of your work? You can, if they want to go to uh, my website, tomlebeff.com, um, you can see my stuff there. You can see more of my stuff there for sure. Yeah. And which animated films should our viewers check out? So projects that you've worked on that maybe they should take a look at. Oh, let me see. Um, well, definitely take a look at look at Ivanville. They're they're doing some crazy stuff. Yeah, I think you'll see the first season on YouTube now. Uh, the season I worked on is still in production. But look at the way that um, Sun Creature is handling. 
that script. Funny, funny stuff. It's just silliness. Um, for feature quality stuff, um, when Ron, Ron's Gone Wrong comes out, definitely look that up. Check out Wish Dragon. And um, that's all I got off the top of my head. All the Blue Sky movies are good, but, you know. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you and everyone for joining us for today's interview. If you're interested in learning more about workflows and techniques in Storyboard Pro, registration for our instructor-led training courses are now open at toonboom.com slash training. And we just uh, posted new blog articles at blog.toonboom.com on the making of the animated trailer for Spiritfarer, as well as the Warhammer 20K Short Hammer and Bolter Death Hand, uh, as well as more information on our training sessions on traditional paperless animation. Next week on the stream, we'll be hosting another panel discussion, this time about studios that work in adult animated projects. And if you enjoyed last week's panel, you won't want to miss this. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm.